As we journey through life, we all encounter ebbs and flows, many highs and lows. We often come across stumbling blocks that leave us feeling quite disheartened or unsure about how to move back to the realm of possibility and positivity. No matter what we undergo, we all can embrace the journey, tap into the tools to push through and overcome, and find the beauty in the ashes. This is Odyssey with Yendi, Beauty in the Ashes. Courtney, I feel like, first of all, I, when we worked together, when we did a shoot together, I don't know if I've ever come across a storyteller who is quite as dynamic as you are as a storyteller. You're so good at it. And I think, I don't know if it's because of how passionate you are with your experience, but I remember being so moved by your story. I felt like the world needed to hear your story. And it's the perfect example of it's not how you start, but how you finish. Um, talk to me a little bit about how Courtney's journey started. Well, <clears throat> my journey started, you know, as someone who had everything, who had little, and who had nothing at all. Yeah. So basically growing up as a child, you know, I grew, I grew with both parents. Life was Life was basically, you know, just a regular middle class situation. But then my mother passed and I had a lot, you know, got myself involved with, you know, persons, yeah. you know, friends, facilitators, persons who were there and, you know, I got myself in a lot of problems until it led me to reach to a point now where, you know, started doing things that wasn't becoming of, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah, so we can continue a little from this, but that is where it all started. And How then, old were you when your mother passed? <laughs> I was about seven years old. Mm. So you knew stability? For my, my mother and my father were together for some time. Yeah. Um, he left the home, mm -hmm. then it was my mother alone. Then my, my father you know, moved back with us, then moved back. So, so it was a lot of contradictions within you. itself. Yeah. Got you. How much of that you think played a part in you going to look for company? In maybe what you would now say was questionable company, but what role do you think that played? Well, the thing is, you know, you see, when you're young, before you're an adolescent, you, you tend to gravitate towards your parents. But as you reach to a certain point, you realize that no, your, your parents are, are no your enemies because what, whatever you, your parents are telling you at that time mm -hmm. is anti, is everything to what you, you want, want to, to do. do. Yeah. Because they're saying studying, they say going to school and all of these things. For me, even myself, not being able to read when I was 13 and 14 years old, and that within itself also caused me to have this resentment towards the formal institution and all of these type mm. of things. How is it that at 13 or 14 you weren't yet literate? Um, literacy was not really an issue for me because the thing is that by affiliating myself with, with the negatives, or, you know, the friends and all of these type of things, at that point in time, they weren't into being literate as well. Mm. So as my grandmother always said, show me your company and I'll tell and you who you are. are. And that time, that was my purpose and that was my family. So whatever they wanted to do, I was comfortable within that, mm. that sphere at the point. Yes, yes. So I yeah. understand that. Um, what are some of the things that you guys would get up to? All right. I don't know how far that I should go about talking Wherever about. Wherever you feel safe or comfortable. All right. So at, at one point, I, I used to attend five different schools. Yeah. I got kicked from all of them. Really? <clears throat> I ended up at Pembroke Secondary. Mm -hmm. That was my, my, the major turning point in my life. Mm -hmm. um, coming from a, a middle class family and then going to school for the first day, and then realizing that you have people coming to school without no shoes at all. Yeah. It's barefoot inside of the school. Yeah. Coming into the school is almost like I was a, a rookie in prison. Walking wow. through the school, seeing everybody giving me that stare, you know, walking inside. 
And I said to myself, if I didn't do something drastic at this point in time, I wouldn't be picked on for the whole entire term or the, mm. for how many years I'm going to be here. This was, I was um, actually coming from Arden at the time. I got kicked from Arden and I came there and it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my entire life. Really? Yeah. The experience I had at Pembroke Hall was none other than, I, I, I don't think that I could have ever experienced anything like that. Yeah. It taught me at one point to share because I saw a lot of need. I myself, I wasn't wealthy or anything like that, but you know, seeing that I had a, a lot to them, right. it, it gave me the opportunity to share. Yeah. It taught me how to stand up for myself because going to a rough school, you had many communities close by. You have Marvale, you have, you know, all of these areas around and you have different persons coming in. Sometimes persons coming in to fight. So it's just, you know, so there is where everything started. So you're at Pembroke, you're getting your feet a bit wet. You're understanding your life, even understanding yourself a bit more. What happens from there? All right. So from there, you know, um, my father and I didn't see eye to eye. My father wanted me to do the, the things that he w was in his eye appropriate. He was a founder of uh, uh, the, one of the first trade unions in Jamaica, yeah. which was UTAS at the time. He was a director um, where at a company he was a manager at JPS. So all of the things, the footsteps that he walked in, he wanted his children to follow into that footsteps, as, in his footsteps as well, yeah. you know. But I was led in a different path because at the time I'd, I thought that my father didn't really like me. You know, it was just a lot of, you know, stability issue, instability issues. He wanted me to, to do a lot of things I didn't really want to do. It. So I had a group of friends. I was about 43 of us. Somewhere off Spanish Town Road. Not, not mentioned in a particular area yeah. because you know how things of are. And um, we used to hurt people, like really hurt people and do things, you know. So things happened and I got shot three times in the first incident. So I got shot here once, here the next time. And in my head right here, so, so wow, I, and I have a bullet lodged in my hand right here. Right and, here now? Yeah, right here. So over a particular period of time, um, each time these incidents used to happen, I, I really couldn't go to hospitals or to healthcare mm -hmm. and all of these things. Yeah. So we'd have to stay where we are and then take care of it for ourselves. And um, I was at one point the black sheep of my family mm -hmm. because my father, know, I, I used to bring a lot of shame to my family. Right. <clears throat> so my, my father used to tell me that, boy, you know, he don't want me to come back inside of the house, you know, all of these type of things. But you see, when you're young and you are not capable of seeing the future or what is in store for you, these are the things that you reminisce on and you know. As I told you before, I was I was 13, 14 years old and I couldn't couldn't read. I, you, know, you know, I find it difficult yeah. because I was born dyslexic. Okay. But when I was 15, 16, and 17, I was teaching math and social studies. Ah, so you're good with numbers. I'm good with numbers, but the thing is that if you don't know, you just don't know. Right, right. Sometimes what what a lot of persons tend to do is try to gravitate towards the, the, the more advanced skill sets before you start the basics. But if you already have the basic, or you, you don't know the basics, you won't, you won't end up understanding what is, you understand? Yes. So what I did was to take my time to learn how to, to do the extreme basics. Yes. And that encompass and helped me to, to understand the more technical stuff yeah. for few, future references yeah. so it enabled me to to teach um so i was doing math and social studies at one point i remember i went into princeville and i saw the former dancehall queen what's her name kiva yeah yeah and she was reminding me that i used to 
rough her up in class. I used to teach her <laughs> as well. Not rough up Kiva. Yeah. I hope you add that to your bio, you know. No. I am uh, Courtney Chen, photographer who used to teach math and rough up Kiva. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, she was one of my students at, at the time as yeah. well. You know, but photography, as you mentioned, is not my main... It's not. No, not, no, not you at all. You just happen to be good at it, but we're going to get there. Right. But what right. is your main thing? What became your main thing? My main, my main career right now, I am a serial facilitator. I love that. Like when I first heard you say that, I was like, what you facilitated. Right. <laughs> so how that works and, and how it helps within a situation where you have multiple persons, you know, being networked together yeah. is that if, if you are not able to afford anything and I have something, I'm always going to be a target. So if I can enable my friends who are around me, my immediate friends and persons who are around me, to help themselves, we can all, all share from each other. Yeah. I won't be a target. And I realize there's a culture in Jamaica that mm -hmm. there's a disparity between who have and, and who, who have, have not. not. And once you work, it don't, rem it don't really even matter if you, you are uh, a person who, are, who is making 10 figures, six figures, seven figures. As long as you're working and you're doing something applicable to yourself, you're always a target. So if, you, if, you, if the persons who are around you have a little or have nothing at all, it's always going to put a strain on you. Yes, So I if you that. can share and you can help another person, it, it lessens, you, it, you elevate yeah. the person and the, you know, other persons come where you are as well. I totally understand that. Um, how does someone who is living the life you're living, literally treating yourself at home with bullet wounds, how does a person come out of that circumstance and out of that space and choose something different for themselves where they're not living looking over their shoulder every day? Well, you know, what I can say that my, my greatest motivation, what I would say, has come from my wife. <clears throat> and uh, my, my life is very personal. Most persons who see me out on the road, they have no idea what I do. You yeah. know, persons always want to know, how come I'm not at a nine to five and I'm not here and I'm not here? Because what happened? My wife, I remember when I got married, my wife and I, we sat down. I was, I was um, the CEO of, of a company that did network infrastructure at one point. And I was telling her that, you know, although, you know, there's a living being made and everything, but I'm not comfortable. And I don't think I want to be doing that anymore. And my wife turned to me and she says, I told her that I wanted to, to be a photographer. Had no experience or anything like that. This was about 13, 14 years ago. And she turned to me and she was saying, you know, babes, hear what happened. Because I love you, what I want you to, to know is that anything at all within your imagination and you want to do it, just go ahead and do it. Oh, bless her. And I will support you 100%. Bless so her. So I, I had to turn around and say, babes, you want to check your temperature? You <laughs> sure you're all right? You understand? Should have a fever, do Yeah, because I was saying, <laughs> you're a black woman living in Jamaica with a man and you're married and I'm telling you this and then you say, I must go ahead. So, I, mean, I, thought, I thought you had a concussion for a moment. But after I realized that, Everything was all right, you know. What a blessing, yeah. though. No, but in a serious way, hearing her say that and support you, mm -hmm. coming from a space where, as a youngster, you didn't necessarily feel supported, what does that evoke in someone with your lived experience? Uh, it, there's a similarity right now of feeling love for the first time. So it's just like I thought I knew everything I needed to know about love now having a son and experiencing that type of emotion is similar to how that feeling was at the yeah. time to have someone who actually believed in you yes Courtney. and then gi giving you the confidence yes because sometimes a person is out there and then they're in the world sometimes why they don't move from one point to another is because they're not assertive enough and they yes they don't and do that, that confidence. Yes. So if they don't believe in themselves, nobody else will believe in them. That's right. Right. But then you meet someone who says to you, 
I believe in you, maybe even more than you believe in you. Right, because... And I don't have a concussion. Right. So go by a camera. Exactly. <laughs> because what happened, my wife was my next door neighbor. Yeah, yeah. And um, when we were growing up, she was going to Campion. When I was going... When I just left from Arden, she was going to Campion. And we used to pass each other every day and all of these type of things. When I want, when I, when I told myself that I didn't want to go to school anymore, my, my wife's mother was the one who paid for my subjects and who encouraged me to stay in school. So even right now, amalgamated together with our family businesses, we, we, we do many different things. So we do a bit of immunology in terms of blood work and all of these type of things where we have a lab. Um, we do greenhouse farming. We have um, dental offices. I do a little bit of photography. And um, yeah, so we don't re really try to, to talk about oneself because collectively as a group, you are stronger. And if you just rely yes. on yourself to say that, oh, I am this or I am that or I am that, you will always be in a box. But yes. I try myself not to put myself in a box because that is only limiting your capabilities. Spot on. So, so when you think about doing things together, as a family, as a unit. That's how the other cultures, I don't want to, to call any names or anything. Other cultures have been able to strive and to continue yes. to, you know. Build generational build gener wealth. Yeah. And, and since you, you hit the topic on generational wealth, the reason why I was able to survive, my father and I had a strenuous relationship in the, in the early part, but after, you know, reaching into my teenage years, my father had looked at me um, with a different, you know, had a different opinion. Mm. And yeah, and he realized that he needed me. Not, not wanted me because I was a son, but needed me because <clears throat> I intrinsically was, was instrumental in his well-being. He got ill at one point and then, you know, we had to facilitate him getting to hospital, being, you know, had to... Anything he needed, I was always there. And as a black sheep, and we didn't talk for seven years any at all, so he would just come to the house. Because nothing to do with him. Everything to do with me, because mm. I wasn't doing the things that he wanted. Mm. Generational wealth, no. So he wanted me to know that anything at all I wanted to achieve, and I cannot work for it, I shouldn't want it. Anything that I wanted, I must wait and don't borrow anything from anybody. I must not rather anybody. So I must just go ahead and purchase it. And if it's not within my grasp, I should just leave it alone. Mm. <clears throat> so he ensured that every single child that he had, he gave me a house. He gave my brother money. He gave my other brother help to buy a house. He gave my sister money to build on to her house. So he wasn't wealthy. But in love, he was wealthy mm. and giving an opportunity and everything. His main thing was to have a family that was, it was a certain cohesion and the family would be together. I'm really glad you guys were able to come back together right. and heal and repair your relationship. Right. What do you think facilitated or allowed you guys to heal and come back together? <laughs> you know, it's a good thing that, that you actually asked that question. And, and the, thing, the thing is that, when you are young, you experience things as a, as a young child. When you are older, you think more mature. Yeah. But if you ex if if you took out that that ability to 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 go through childhood, you would have robbed yourself of of a whole entire experience. A word, Courtney. Right. Yeah. So, everything that amalgamated from the experiences, the good, the bad, and the indifference. I think that everything has to transition in life for you to reach to a certain point. Yes. So if we had missed out one point, it would have, it wouldn't be worth. So sometimes when you go through a bad experience, the good experiences after a particular period of time gives you the ability to look back and you, you more enjoy your life at that point when you look back and see all of those negatives and the positives together. It's, it's so interesting to hear you say that because literally this is beauty in the ashes and a lot of people have negative experiences or things that are traumatic but as you rightfully shared a while ago you really can extract and pull beauty
directly from those traumatic experiences. You know, you really can pull something out of it because growth comes from those experiences. You know, and looking back at it, you realize how much you've grown having had the experience. Exactly. Because if you didn't live it, right. you wouldn't be who you are with the growth that you have, right. you know? Um, what do you say to the youngster who is living a life of a lot of risk? who is looking at this now, who is perhaps trying to make a really big decision um, whether to continue in that life that is a really risky life or to become a businessman and, you know, generate wealth in a way that doesn't put his life on the line. What do you say to that youngster? If I should try to put everything into context, sometimes... We use a terminology to say role models. Sometimes if you don't have a particular person there just to give you an encouragement. I always say to persons that it's just a split second in time that caused Yendi to be Yendi, Courtney to be Courtney. There's a possibility that I could be where you are and there's a possibility you could be where I am. But you have to be mindful of every single decision that you make. Yeah. And cotton on, try to cotton on and try to be in association with persons who are at a higher level than you are. Yes. At all times. Yes. Because the thing is that if everybody is at the same level, there is no growth. Yes. And you are at the same level that I am computationally. And the other person is at the same level. That means you are at a stage where there is no more enhancement. So if one was at an A-level level and you have one person at CXC and then you have one person at common entrance, the common entrance person could learn from the person who is there doing CAPE and then the CAPE person could learn from the person who is doing the A-level. So it's just a cycle going around and around. I just so have to tell you though, you just said common entrance. You know, you just dated yourself. <laughs> <laughs> By exactly. the way, I did common entrance oh, too. Okay, okay. But it's now pep. Exactly. Get exactly. with it. I'm telling you. <laughs> but go ahead, yeah. yeah so, <laughs> everything in this life, what I realize, I am just one person and one experience. Yeah. But my experience spans a very, very broad demography of persons who you would claim that is way, way, way down there and persons who are at the top of their games. The differences within the confines of Jamaica that I've realized is that once someone is, is up, they're not really trying to bring up another person. Most people. Facts. No, so, spot on. Yeah. So what I realize is that in my endeavors and every day of my life, what I try to do is try to help other people. There are two analogies, two things that changed my entire life. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if we have time to talk about Tell it. Tell me. So one story in particular was where <clears throat> my father, when I was going to Arden at the time, my father was saying to me that, I was on the evening chief and was saying that, don't make a certain time pass you on the road and all of these type of things, you know, whatever. So I grew up in a very disciplined household. So my father, the day you now he gave me my money, I went to school. But as, as youths, we were playing football and, you know, and at the time, it was five cents for bus fare. So I was playing football now and, and my five cents lost. I was late to reach home. So I was, you know, come all the way down to halfway tree now and everything. And all my friends gone, leave me. So I said to myself, you no, know, how I reach home? Because if I don't reach home in time now, main problem with my father. So I saw this lady. In the middle of halfway tree, there were the cemeteries at the bus stop. And I, I, I went to the lady, I said, Miss, I've never done this before, but I don't know if you could assist me because I need to get home. You know, I was giving her the story and I need five cents for my bus fare. And the lady's response changed my life forever. The lady says, that's all on the youth, good for us, come and beg people and all of these things. Yeah. And I was so ashamed. I was so embarrassed today. It's almost like I disappeared. But the thing is that, in, in retrospect, looking back, if the lady had given me 
that five cents, it would have encouraged me to go the next day and then ask somebody for something and ask and ask. Then I would be dependent over time on, on somebody else. So in her response to me, which was negative at the time, yes. turned out to be one of my most positive right. roles, which if I needed something, I should just try to do without or work towards getting it. And not to try to always go to someone to ask for assistance every time that I needed something. Yeah. And the second one is I remember one day I was at the traffic light um, at Ligani. And a guy come to wipe my, my car glass and all of the guys, every, all of them know me, every single one of the guys, because yeah. I don't like when people, I, I don't like intimidation, I, you know, because of what I went through and all of that. Of I don't want somebody to feel like they want to come and intimidate me, open my car and wipe my car. I have to do something. So the day the, the guy come now, him, him come and him say, boss, say, yo, you want a, a, a wipe, you want to wipe your car glass? And I say, I'm good, you know. And him walk past and I say, yo, come here. Come around and think. Take out five hundred dollars and give me. I'm asking what how are you so bossy? I'm gonna say, yo, here one. All of we need somebody, you know. And you see, you see, although you see me give this, it's not because you there and me intimidated them, but me I'll give you. Because anytime me need a anytime I have a problem, is you when you help me. Right. Him say I chew, I chew, you know. And here what now. As I put the car in gear, the car stall right in the middle of the road and overheat. And it seems the same one turn and push the car out of the road. Wow. And we just look at each other and I laugh and I say, you see that? Yeah. So what we, we have to realize is that everything is interconnected. Yes, Courtney. So although you are here and you are in a certain position, I may be here and not in that position, but I need you just as much as you Absolutely. need me. So as long as we understand that and that we can't do without a garbage man, although people say, boy, them scan them, and they, but if the garbage collectors don't come around for Absolutely. a week, what, what, what happened? Absolutely. I always tell this, give the, the story I of, I don't know how to lay tiles. I can't fix a roof. When those people come around, they are integral to me being able to sleep peacefully at night. Otherwise, my house drop down. So this, this thing that we do, especially in some cultures where we look down upon certain careers, really needs to stop because we literally can't function without the other we are, as you rightfully said, we're so interconnected. We need each other. Right. We need each other. And um, for the persons who are viewing your, your program, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a proper speaker. I, this is the first time I'm actually coming on camera. Yeah, but the thing is that something, sometimes um, persons might see someone, because a lot of persons look up to me, which I look up to other persons. Right? Yeah. And the thing is that a lot of persons who have seen me out there doing you know what I do have no idea that I used to actually pack shelves in supermarkets. I used to work at Lenap at one point. That was my first time trying to, to work. Because after being through certain situations and everything, I said to myself, say, you know, I don't really want to do the life what I wanted I was doing anymore. You know, I wanted to try an honest living. And after trying it for about a couple of months, I realized that working for someone, it wasn't my forte. Right. I tried woodwork a couple months, that didn't work out. So I tried different things just right. to say I tried. Right. And after that, because of my inability to read and all of these type of things, you know, my brother looked at me one day and said, oh, it looks so stressed out, man. You know, hear what, I have something for you. And that was my first opportunity to be a business owner that he gave me my computer, the first computer I ever owned. And I never turned it on. I just looked at it and I pulled it down and I put it back up together. No and I way. said, yeah. And I said, this is what I want to do. I've never turned on a computer before. And, wow. and I, that was my introduction to, to starting my first business. My first business was more um, network infrastructure based. And I taught myself every single thing from scratch. So how to pull it down, how to put it up. I had a, a <clears throat> I was affiliated with a distributor for many years. The name is Incomix. And they're located at Marketplace now. I had a good relationship for many years. Then after that now, I was a, a manager for a, a consulting firm that the, every time they had problems with airport security, they had problems with coding and all of these things. I would have dealt with their type of thing for them. And you're self-taught. 
everything, every single thing is self-taught. My, my father, who left as a senior manager at JPS, he had one year of school in my entire life. All in my family, my aunt is, is a scientist. She was one of the production persons behind like soaps like Lever 2000, Life Boy, and all of these type of things. And the, the girls are the educated ones, the boys, um, like even myself, all of us are slow learners. I have a sister, she was at UA, you know, she was a treasurer of the guild and all of these type of things. Another sister, all of these, the younger generation, they're, they, you know, from they were born, they're born smart. As boys, we tend to, you know, be much at a slower pace. But what I learned, I am a visual person. You have persons who learn auditorily. But I'm a visual person and I learn from the experiences of life. So each time when I look around, I look at my environment and I always take something from it. So even on my way here today, I'm just observing the lighting conditions and how hot it is. And then it's reali I realize now that I should have dressed appropriately to come at the interview. <laughs> that is too funny. Right. You are too funny. So the person who thinks that education and a lack of education is the thing that is stopping them, mm -hmm. what do you say to them? Well, there's education and there's education. Aye. So yes. you have both informal and formal education. That's right. So the formal system, it's one way to help yourself to work for someone else. Informal education is a street knowledge where you enable yourself to work for yourself. I don't think anyone... As you rightfully said, the people who know you and look on now and know you as a successful business person, no one would ever think that that's how your story started. Well, the thing is that in life, you always have to have this, this aspect of your life, which is the element of surprise. Yeah. And if, if you look back at all the successful persons that ever existed in Jamaica, there is always a story. Some persons look at you at the end game, at the end point, and say, wow, that person lived such a, a life or whatever. But they had to start somewhere, and, and generally it is starting from the bottom. Yeah. Courtney, thank you so much. I'm, I think you're such an inspiration, and I'm so proud of you. So, you so, so much, proud of you. you. You're just you. nice. Thank you. Thank you're you. nice, thank bad. You. Thank you. Thank you. We like you, no? Same here. We like you, bad. Please give your son my love. Please I will. tell your wife I said she's the ultimate goodie because okay. she's a little angel that I think you needed. Okay. And I love that. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, man. And thanks thank for having you. me. Thank you. Right. Starting from the bottom, now we're here. <laughs> hey! Hey! <laughs> <laughs>